A full four years ago, I did a video about all the saddest moments for some of the most devastating losses in title fights in the history of the sport. And while there's been a lot of sadness since then, so it's definitely time to revisit this topic. Warning right now, get yourself a tissue box. Big shout out to Vincero. They've hooked us up with some of their glasses. We've got the Midway over here. I've got the Cooper, and this is the Frankie. You look like you love a hot dog. <laughs> so these are the Villa, and they are very yeah. comfortable. I wear glasses every they look day, comfortable. mate. I wear glasses every day. These are very comfortable. You know when you buy bad sunglasses and they just feel flimsy and horrible? Not even actually bad sunglasses, but these are really nice and firm, which is how I like my sunglasses. Well, mate, even if you did sit on them and break them, they have a repair policy and they will fix them for you for free. All you gotta do is send them back. Seriously? What, yeah. what for accidental damage? Accidental damage, mate. If Tony Ferguson comes and punches Luke in the face, yes. breaks those glasses, <laughs> goes, hello, mate, those belong to me, he can get those fixed. You've paid for that when you bought the glasses. It's included in the price. That's amazing. So, yeah. Unreal, yeah. That is such a good deal. So if you want to get yourself a new pair of sunglasses, you can get 20% off and free shipping if you use the code MMAOP at Vincero collective.com slash MMA on point. So that's 20% off with the code MMAOP at V-I-N-C-E-R-O collective.com slash MMAOP. The link is in the description. Well, now that you've got your sunglasses, at least nobody can see you cry. Let's get into it. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point. A huge thank you to the Channel Hall of Famers for their massive support. And these are 10 more of the most heartbreaking moments in title fights. Number 10, Rich Franklin versus Anderson Silva 2. You just can't help but feel for a nice dude like Rich Franklin. He really has always been a shining example of how to do it right in the sport. And his shocking loss to Anderson Silva in their first bout for the middleweight strap came as a surprise to at least me at the time not yet realizing we were seeing the greatest ever. And so when Rich built up two more wins to get a rematch, in his hometown no less, it felt like maybe he had a shot here, and that maybe there could be a trilogy. Franklin, classy as ever, even told Silva in his pre-fight promo, we'll do the third one in Brazil. It was domination by the spider, and a minute into the second round, Silva would yet again put away Ace with vicious knees. Rich afterwards apologized to his hometown crowd for his performance, and asked that they not boo Anderson, because because he's probably the nicest dude ever and he's amazing at losing. Just watch his TED talk about it. When you're sinking in quicksand, the more you struggle, the faster you sink. This led to a vicious first round victory for my opponent. And within about an hour, I went from an arena of 20,000 screaming fans to a hotel room in the Mandalay Bay sitting by myself. Even still though, to get beat like that after earning a second chance at it and in front of his hometown, knowing that this was it and that he would never get that belt back because he was never going to beat Anderson, it is a rough one, even if Rich handled it about as well as someone could. Number nine, Darren Till versus Tyron Woodley. After the win over Cowboy, we might have pushed him a little too soon. And this disaster title fight was the result of that. After storming the scene and being compared to Conor McGregor, Till would headline a car in his fifth fight and get a hometown main event by his next one. The resulting hype saw the undefeated fighter out of Liverpool put in place of Colby Covington, who wouldn't be able to make a September 2018 date for a bout with welterweight champion Tyron Woodley. To say the fight didn't go well would be putting it lightly. Till would land a single strike and get battered, knocked down, and choked out before the end of the second. It was one of the most lopsided losses in title fight history and completely took the wind out of Till's sails. And while it was brutal in the moment, knowing this bright prospect had been thrown into the wood chipper, it's even more heartbreaking after the fact, as Till has struggled since then considerably in his career and has had difficulties with his confidence. It was hard, man. Like, even walking out there tonight, I was, I was so terrified. I was I was scared, man. The London show was about me. Not to disrespect any fight of mine, but it was me. It wasn't Masvidal. It was that until show, and then he come and stole the show, and now, he, you know, he's got all this, and I, I want to get there again. And Maybe if he'd had a bit more time to develop, things would have gone a different way for a fighter many felt was going to be the next big thing, but they didn't, and now we'll never know. Number 8. Shinya Aoki versus Gilbert Melendez Three years after the death of Pride, the great Japanese fight tradition was being kept alive mostly by Shinya Aoki and Dream. Aoki was the promotion's lightweight champion, he was the shudo middleweight title holder, and he'd just broken Mizuto Hirota's arm, 
Now he would have the chance to fight possibly the best lightweight in the world, Gil Melendez, Strike Force's 155 pound king. But there was way more on the line in Aoki's head than just another title or his own personal glory. He told fighters only, if Aoki loses, it's over for Japan. I love Japan and it is certain that if I lose, Japan will become a colony of US MMA. Given Pride's absorption by the UFC, a drought in Japanese stars, and the sport's greatest fighters shifting to US promotions, he was right, this fight did hold a lot of weight. Unfortunately, Aoki could do absolutely nothing to Melendez, failing on all 18 of his takedown attempts and being outstruck 114 to 17. All three judges would give it to Gil 50-45. Shinya, who put the long and storied history of Japanese MMA on his shoulders, had failed. Only two years later, Dream would be dead, and Japan has yet to return to the powerhouse status it once held in the sport. Number 7, Dustin Poirier versus Charles Oliver. Era. This is one of those fights that when it got booked, you just knew you were going to be hurting afterwards. Both guys are two of the most beloved fighters by the fandom, so when you pair them up, somebody is going to have to lose, and in MMA, of course, that can mean a whole lot more than just an L on the record. While Oliveira's shocking rise to the top was the capstone of his career, Dustin Poirier was still reaching for his. He'd won interim gold, but lost the unification bout handedly to Habib, and even at that time, it felt like that might be the last chance he he ever would have to capture gold. But following a connor related detour, which saw the Diamond get the Brinks truck backed up to his house, he found himself with one more opportunity in Oliveira. After a hot start in the first and spending most of the second on his back, disaster struck when Oliveira secured a rear naked choke standing. It felt weirdly anticlimactic. It all happened so fast, it felt like that wasn't supposed to be the end. That Poirier's last ride would end in a blaze of glory. But such is MMA. Sometimes you just just get caught. He of course took it like a champ, and he is still a fan favorite. Guy's good, man. He's the champ. But to go out like that in his last chance to earn a title, it just stung a whole bunch. Number six, Glover Teixeira versus Jamal Hill. One of the most unexpected title reigns in recent memory was that of Twilight Glover Teixeira. After nearly a decade in the UFC, at the tender age of 42, the Brazilian fan favorite finally captured light heavyweight gold against Jan Blahovic. A full seven years after he was defeated by John Jones in his previous attempt when he was at his peak as a fighter. He would lose the belt in an all-time classic against Yuri Prohaska in his very first defense, but the new champ was forced to vacate due to injury, and so Old Man Glover found himself fighting yet again for the strap with Jamal Hill. Despite it earning Fight of the Night honors, it was one-way traffic with Hill getting 50-44s across the board and landing a brutal 232 significant strikes, the most by about a hundred that Teixeira had ever suffered in a single bout. And as if one of the nicest and most respectful fighters in the sport getting battered for 25 minutes wasn't hard enough to watch, Glover would retire after the bout, a step that relieved a lot of fans but also made the way he went out hurt that much more. Not to mention, the dude was in his home country for the first time in like almost a decade, and because the fight was so lopsided, the jerk-ass fans couldn't even bother to stick around for the guy's retirement speech. Just heartbreaking. For Teixeira, I'm sure this is exactly how he saw himself ending his career, and it's rare to get to do so at such a high level, but the punishment he took on the way out was very tough to watch. Number 5. Jose Aldo versus Piotr Jan Seeing our favorite fighters fade with age is just part of being an MMA fan as much as it hurts, but there are only a few fighters that have ever reached the mythical status of Jose Aldo. Furthermore, usually these aging fighters find themselves outside the title picture, and so it was the unique circumstance of Aldo fighting Pyotr Jan for the vacant bantamweight strap in 2020 that in part makes this entry uniquely sad. Jose has of course looked human, this was years after Connor and Max, but there's just something about how badly he was beaten in the fifth round by Jan. Seeing Aldo pummeled on the ground like that was almost surreal when thinking about the height of his career. It got even harder to watch when it felt like somebody should just step in and end it. 59 ground shots in that round in total before it was called. On his knees after the stoppage, with his head on the mat in his hands, Jose looked for the first time frail, and I use that word in the sense of the sport, not as a human being. It's a moment that will stick with me forever, and a reminder that none of us can stay on top forever. Number 4. Korean Zombie vs. Alexander Volkanovsky It is never good when the commentary team is saying that they feel like a fighter shouldn't be going out for the next round, but that is exactly what was being said following the third in the bout with TKZ and Alex the Great. Zombie has been a 
fan favorite since just about the first time he fought, and you would be hard-pressed to find someone who wouldn't be excited to see him finally earn a title. His last attempt ended freakishly with a separated shoulder against Jose Aldo back in 2013. Last year's shot against Volk was certainly going to be TKZ's last chance, but of course he was going up against the best of the best, and in the third round had been knocked down and was getting battered. It certainly should not have gone into the fourth, but of course it did. Mercifully, at the first sign of trouble, Herb Dean jumped in, with a defeated zombie standing there in a daze. Now, if you know anything about Zombie and how he takes losses, you know he is very, very hard on himself. And heartbreakingly, TKZ said in his post-fight interview, a sentiment that the translator kindly excluded, I now know I can't be a UFC champion. Damn. Yeah, that hurts. Number 3. Daniel Cormier vs. Stipe Miocic 3 One of the great travesties by the UFC during the pandemic era was what happened to Daniel Cormier in the final fight of his career. DC was for the third time taking on Stipe Miocic to settle their heavyweight title rivalry. A thorough beating and nasty eye poke later, and Cormier had seen the last bout of his career, retiring more than a year after he said he would when he hit 40. Me fighting Stipe Miocic after my back surgery those two times, that wasn't the same fight. I couldn't wrestle. I should have stopped in 18. I was so severely limited, it was crazy. But as is the case with so many of our beloved favorites, he did not. And the unfortunate timing of DC's final bout left him in a soulless apex center without a single fight fan to give him the proper farewell that he deserved for such an epic career. Just the way he came up so short in that fight, and then for his career to end so unceremoniously, it just sucked. It would be great if the UFC would decide to give him a proper Robbie Lawler-like send-off in the future, since the one he got was just nowhere near the level of what DC brought to the table. Number 2. Joseph Benavidez vs. Davison Figueredo Megiddo Levy described this as the worst day of her and Joe's lives, and I think it's important to remember that for most of the fighters and their families on this list, that exact sentiment applies to varying degrees. After controversy over a head clash in their first fight, and Figgy missing weight leaving the flyweight title vacant, the two ran it back on Fight Island, and it was brutal. Whether you are a fan of Benavidez or not, this was a particularly hard fight to watch because of the severity of the damage sustained for almost all of the four some odd minutes this one lasted, ending with a vicious technical submission choke. The UFC did a documentary about Fight Island, and in part of it chronicled the aftermath with Olivi and Joe B. If you're a fan, it's a tough one to watch. I hate letting everybody else down. You, you haven't let a single person down. I know. But... We don't love you because you were going to fight for the world title, we love you because of the person you are especially knowing that this was his last shot at gold, but even just as a person, it illustrates how hard this sport really is. Number 1. Tony Ferguson vs. Justin Gaethje I gotta be honest, I am so sick of talking about the bad times for this man, because he really had some of the absolute best, and it feels like all we ever talk about as fans anymore is what happened recently. But his run at lightweight should be considered one of the best ever, championship or not. Which, of course, is a big part of what made the end of his epic streak in this loss to Justin Gaethje so heartbreaking. It wasn't even for the title. Yet again, it was for more interim gold. In all that time, with all the circumstances that prevented it, Tony Ferguson never once got to fight for the true lightweight title like he deserved, and that alone makes this entry worthy of our number one spot. He was right there yet again. If he beat Gaethje, he was finally going to fight Habib. Unfortunately, the fifth round TKO loss ensured that was not a possibility. And knowing now, as we do, that he would lose his next five bouts after that just makes this all the more bitter a pill to swallow. Tony Ferguson truly deserved better. This was not a fun process. My apologies to our editor, Luke Taylor. Make it up to him by following him on his socials. And hey, if you want more sadness or you want more happiness, you might have a little bit of say if you become a channel member, like our channel champions. These folks right here are making this stuff possible. We appreciate it so much. That little join button right down there you could watch our writers' meetings live and say what you think about them in the live chat. We interact with it the whole time. If not, liking and subscribing would help too. Tells us if you liked the idea and want more. No matter what, thanks a lot for sticking with me through this one, guys. Go watch something happy after this and give somebody a hug. I'll talk to you later.